by God's grace and for His glory. This is Woodmont Baptist Church. Caleb, thanks. I feel like having the cello just immediately lends some gravitas to whatever we're doing here uh, and just elevates our worship. Thank you, uh, Caleb. His mom's here all the way from California. You got your senior recital coming up. Is that right? Yeah. When is that? Saturday night at Belmont University, come here, our own Caleb Yang is going to destroy some cello music. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. I mean that in a good way, rock and roll, uh, cello music. It's going to be awesome, Saturday night at Belmont. It's been a crazy week. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Having to, to watch uh, a sovereign country invaded by another country. It's, we've had some hard conversations at my house. I'm sure you probably have too at your house about what's going on in our world. So thank God that we have good news. And today we're going to hear good news proclaimed from God's word in a minute. But before we get to that, I think it's right and it's appropriate for us as God's people just to come to the Lord now and do what we can do. The most important thing that we can do for Ukraine right now and Belarus and these places in the world is to pray. So we're going to pray. It's the most powerful thing and the most effective thing that we can do. There are a couple of organizations that I want to talk to our missions committee about that we can support that are doing God's work in Ukraine right now. But uh, before we do that, I just want us to come together as the body of Christ and pray and lift up the situation in Ukraine right now. The, the school that I went to for Divinity School, Beeson Divinity School, has a guy who graduated last year named Anton. He's Russian. His wife, Dasha, is Ukrainian. Very interesting. And their son was born in Birmingham as they were students at Beeson Divinity School. Very interesting global family. And he was asked to write a blog post for Beeson Divinity School, and so he wrote these words just last night, and I want to share them with you. Irreversible. Perhaps this is what the disciples thought when they saw Christ hanging on the cross. Dostoevsky knew of the pain of the coming death and of suffering, and he begins his unforgettable novel, The Brothers Karamazov, with these words of our Lord. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Perhaps it feels and looks like death in the family of God today in, in Ukraine. But the people that Anton has spoken to in Ukraine remain hopeful. And this hope is based on nothing else but on the fact that the Lord is the resurrection and the life. And the Lord calls into existence the things that do not exist. And the Lord is able to heal the land of Ukraine. Ultimately, we believe that the Lord's going to make the new heaven and new earth. But now I want to remind us all of the vows that we have made before God when we made a public profession of faith and joined the intercontinental family of God. Bear one another's burdens. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Be kind and compassionate. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. These vows that we have taken, we who have taken on the name of Christ, are called to uphold our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and Belarus and in Russia and all around the world. So what we're going to do is say a, a liturgical prayer together. It'll be on the screens. This is a liturgy adapted from Doug McKelvey's book, Every Moment Holy. It's a liturgy for a national tragedy. And I'm going to read the, the white part, and if you'll respond, all of us together, with the yellow part as we say this prayer together, a liturgy for what is a national tragedy in the Ukraine. O oh God who gathers what has been scattered, 
shelter us now in the shadow of your wings. O Christ, who binds our wounds, be our great healer. O Spirit, who enters our every grief, intercede now for a hurting people in a broken land. Be merciful to those now wounded. Be present with those now bereaved. You do not run from our brokenness, O God. You move ever toward those in need. Your heart is always inclined toward those who suffer. Now let your mercies be active through the hands, the words, and the compassionate care of those who willingly enter this sadness to console and serve. Be with all who move toward this need. The helpers, the counselors, the first responders, the churches, those who offer aid and protection, the pastors and intercessors, those who meet immediate practical needs, those who seek to heal physical wounds, and those who come after to carry on the long, hard work of rebuilding families and hearts and lives and community. Grant each of them wisdom, courage, vision, sympathy, and strength to serve effectively in their various capacities. Even in the shadow of such tragedy, let us not lose hope. Give us eyes to see the rapid movements of mercy rushing to fill these newly wounded spaces. Let us see in the echoes of your own mercy and compassion, a foretaste of your kingdom coming to earth. And move our own hearts also, equipping us to intercede, to act, and to respond however we're able. Arrest the hearts and stay the hands of any who even now might be plotting further evil and violence against others, O oh Christ. Turn them from hatred. Turn their hearts to you. You once brooded over the formless chaos of ancient waters and brought forth the order and flourishing of creation. Do so again, O oh Spirit of God. From the chaos of this conflict, call forth new life and order and flourishing. Take even what the adversary might have meant for evil and from it bring forth eternal good. You alone have strength to carry this people. Carry us now, O Lord. You alone have wisdom and power to heal the wounds of a nation and of your world. Heal us, O Lord. You alone have compassion enough to enter into widespread grief and to turn it to hope. Be merciful, O oh Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a pastoral prayer that Rachel's going to lead us in later. But for now, we're going to lift our hearts to the Lord. We're going to sing. We're going to worship. For now, I want you to turn your attention to the screens for some announcements from Evan and prepare your heart for what the Lord wants to do in you today. Good morning and welcome to Woodmont. If you're a guest with us this morning, we are so, so glad you're here and we want to make your visit as welcoming and smooth as possible. So would you do us a favor and fill out the Connect card, which you can find either online at woodmontbaptist.com and the pew rack in front of you or by scanning the QR code at the bottom of your bulletin. Nothing crazy going on here. We just would love to get to know you a little better and let you learn a little bit about us as well. As always, we're grateful for your giving and grateful that God lets us be a part of his work in such meaningful and simple ways. You can continue to give online, through the mail, via text, or at the drop box outside either of the sanctuary doors. Our new women's Bible study is about to kick off on March 8th. We'll be going through Angie Smith's eight-week study, Matchless. And you can join us in person here at Woodmont on either Tuesday night at 6.30 or Thursday morning at 9.30. Books are $5, and you can find more information as well as registration at woodmontbaptist.com slash matchless. Men, it's been a while since we've gotten together, and we think it's time to change that. So we'll be starting back up the men's breakfast on the second Saturday of every month, starting on March 12th. Breakfast will be served for $5 and ready at 8 o'clock, followed by a time of gathering around the Word together. If you're interested in serving as a cook or speaker, let Nathan know, and we'll get you connected. All right, that's all the announcements this morning. Now to the good stuff. Why don't we stand as the worship team leads us in God of grace and God of glory. I mean, let's stand together and worship.
excited to sit down with you. Let's start with just in general, what is a life group? And so a life group to me is really a small group of Bible study where there is fellowship and a commitment to one another. And the nice thing about it is that life group is coming with so many life experiences and being willing to share and being open uh, about sharing. It's also important to me that to be in a life group that really uh, digs into the scripture. And so I think I have found that with this group of people. What kinds of things does a life group do together for one another mm -hmm. when they're with together, when they're not meeting right, together? Right. What kind of things? Uh, I never thought I would be in the position that I would be a widow. And uh, in 2020, I did become a widow right before COVID started. And then there are other women in the class who are in the same um, as who are just like me. And so we are having to learn to navigate life differently than we once did. And it's, so it's comforting when you're with people who are like you and who are different from you too. I, I like diversity. And um, so we, we really take time to check on one another, to pray for one another. I try to send out uh, emails each week after class just to kind of update to the ones who can attend. We have a lot of people who are still at home and who just physically cannot come to church. And, um, and I always try to get as many prayer requests as, as I can. And the other thing we do, is our class has always been um, very involved with Room in the Inn in some way. And so we wanted to get back to that. We haven't, we did not come back together until October of 2021. But during that time uh, and in our discussion, it was very important that we still reach out and help with that ministry. And so we have been collecting warm clothes for that group that comes to our church. That's awesome, that's awesome. So why should someone be involved in a life group? Well, last Sunday I had an aha moment. Uh, you know, for me, you know, when we, are, when I was a younger child, and then as, as working in Bible school so much with children, you remember that verse in, um, it's uh, Psalms, I think it's 1, 115, but it's how uh, God is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. And you know, as a young child, you just think, oh, you know, once I have God and God's gonna lead me, but as you get older, you still need that direction from God. And for me as a learner, I have never been a good learner in isolation. Mm. I'm a group learner. But I feel the same way about life groups. I think that you need to be in a group where, you know, if you're having trouble or if you just had a great week with something to share your the good and the bad of life. But we all cannot thrive. And our Christianity can't thrive if we're just in total isolation. I have to have that. It's just important. We all need love. We all need to know that there are people who are going to reach out to us and care about us through the good and the bad of life. Well, Donna, this has been so great. Thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about life groups. We're so grateful to have you here at Woodmont. I know the DFW class is immensely grateful to have you around. Amen. Well, one of the ways we do life together as a church is by worship and singing together. So let's stand this morning as we sing and proclaim the gospel of Christ. He is our rock and our redeemer. Let's worship. Thank you. 
church family. It is so good to see your faces. Actually, can I borrow that for a second? I need to use my Bible. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Before we pray, my name is Rachel. It's a privilege to see you all this morning. Before we pray, I wanted to share with you something that God was teaching me about prayer um, from a recent sermon I heard by Sam Alberry. He was teaching on the Lord's Prayer, and he said, the Lord's Prayer teaches us that the purpose of prayer is to not get God on board with our agenda, but to get us on board with God's agenda. Another, another way he said it was, it's not bending God's will to ours, but bending our will to God's. He said, I can't pray, hallowed be your name, Lord, without also praying at the same time, my name doesn't need to be hallowed. I can't pray, Lord, your kingdom come, without also praying, and my kingdom can go. I can't pray, thy will be done, 
without also praying. And my will can take a back seat, frankly. I like that one. In light of that perspective of the Lord's Prayer, let me lead us in a word of prayer. And before I do, I wanted to invite anyone who feels comfortable. Um, I'm going to get on my knees just in a posture of prayer. Wish me luck in my dress. But just in a posture of prayer, if anyone feels comfortable, if we are praying to the King of Kings, then this is a great place to be. So if anyone feels comfortable, you can join me. And if not, you can pray where you are. Father God, we are so grateful to be in your presence this morning. God, you are holy. We've been learning about that in the children's ministry. You are set apart. You are glorious, God. You hold everything in your hands. You are almighty Father, creator, savior, sustainer. God, you are the king of kings, and there's no place that we should be but on our knees before you, God. God, we confess that as people, we are broken. There is a lot on our shoulders in this room this morning. God, you know every need in this room. You know every heart, every circumstance, every thought, every fear. And God, we need you. God, we pray that you would transform our hearts change our hearts, God, that we would desire the things of you and not desire our own glory, our own um, fulfillment, God, but we would really want what you want. I pray, God, that you would be with the needs of our faith family for James Carter, Glenda Cleaver, Murtis Owens, Jane Region, Cora Southern. God, we're so grateful that she went home on Wednesday. Thank you for Cora's life and for the blessing that she is to Andrew and Anna, to this faith family. God, we pray for them as she transitions to being home. We pray for the Hamilton and Betty families, God, as uh, they have lost loved ones. Lord, we pray for comfort. Thank you for our church leaders, for Aaron as he leads us in worship, God. For Nathan as he preaches, Lord, would your hand be upon him? Would Would you speak through him, God, words of truth? Would it settle in our hearts, God, in a way that changes us? Oh God, we pray for unity among our church family, that we would shine as lights in this broken world. Unity, God, in the midst of COVID, unity among um, all that's happening around us. God, give us unity that we would be different. God, I pray for our president, for our government. As Nathan prayed, as we prayed together, we pray for the people of Ukraine. God, our hearts are burdened for them for those that are fleeing their homes for safety, God, those that are staying behind. God, we pray that your spirit would move among the believers there, God, that you would work in a mighty way through something that we don't fully understand. I know I don't. So God, we just pray for comfort for the people there and for peace, Father, for justice. Um, we pray that you would make the Ukrainian believers lights in, the, in a dark place and that you, your gospel be, would be proclaimed and received. And together now as a church, we pray as you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, choir and instrumentalists, for reminding us the centerpiece of God's plan to make all things new centers around the person of Jesus Christ. Bill, is it true that you hung this cross right here? Was that, Bill, what year was that? Any idea? 1970, only a couple years into your pastorate, elevated the name of Jesus by installing this massive cross behind us to remind us of the supremacy, the primacy, and the centrality of Jesus Christ to the gospel of what God is doing. Thank you for Aaron for a very Christocentric worship service today, and thank you for Bill and for others for providing such an important reminder of the primacy and the centrality of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Isaiah, you know our five-year-old, uh, he always keeps us on our toes and keeps us entertained, and uh, recently, this past week, he grabbed my wallet off of the table and pulled the, the bit of cash that I had in my wallet out and said, ooh, money. And then, uh, you know, we kind of said, hey, stop that, put it back. And, and then uh, he looked right at Morgan and without any hesitation, in all sincerity, said, Mom, when you pass, can I have all your money? <laughs> she said, what did you say? He said, when you, when you pass, can I have all your money? I don't know where he's heard that. I don't know where he gets that. I don't even usually say the word pass. I usually just say uh, die to remember that someone died. But uh, this is original sin at work, right? Because he values money, apparently, so highly already at a very young age. And later, Morgan was talking to her parents about it and told them what Isaiah had said. And uh, her dad is a, a banker and always the pragmatist, you know, and he said, uh, well, tell him that he can pay all the bills then, too, when he has all the money. And, you know, Isaiah made a couple of wrong assumptions that day. Number one, he assumed because of the, the bit of cash that I had in my wallet that we had a lot of money, apparently. <laughs> and number two, he assumed that uh, money would, would solve all his problems, that when he's an adult, when he's a grown-up, that he would live with such a freedom and, and have uh, uh, freedom from uh, all the worries and responsibilities. But as my father-in-law pointed out, you know, you, we have a lot of young adults in our, our church who are just beginning that journey of adulting, and there are taxes to be filed. By the way, it's, it's February, the end of February. Maybe you need to get on that. There's insurance to procure. There's license plates to be renewed. There are bills to pay. There are more responsibilities to being an adult than Isaiah could possibly realize at five. But he was right about one thing. He was right in his desire to, to live free. Free from scarcity. Free from worry about material things. And apparently he wants to live free from parental authority or at least parental presence or something, I don't know. We all have this inherent desire. And it's not a, a necessarily misplaced desire to live free. And freedom, of course, in this country is a particularly valued ideal. Uh, we, the writers of our Declaration of Independence famously wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a theological argument, isn't it? That because people were created by God, that they have these inherent rights, People are created in God's image and therefore worthy of inherent dignity. And we know that over the centuries, our country has had to work very hard and is still working to make sure that those rights extend to all people. The writers of the Declaration, though, were taking this bold step to throw off the tyranny of King George and the oppressive British monarchy that had exploited the colonies. But the revolution that ultimately freed the colonies and, and freed the, the, uh, United, what would become the United States was, was not truly the revolution that they needed. What they needed was something much deeper. 
Because the revolution that we need is not waged with guns. And the real oppressor of our lives isn't a country across the sea. It's not a lack of money either, like Isaiah thought. It's not crushing responsibilities. Those things are not ultimately what enslave us and keep us from being free. We're each held captive by something much more sinister and much more destructive than all these things. And the freedom that we long for isn't ultimately political freedom. We're more broken. We're more flawed. We're more desperate. We're more wrecked by sin than we could ever realize. And the, the thing is, we can't organize a militia or establish a continental army to deal with it. Nothing can overcome it that we can figure out for ourselves. But there's good news. We've seen throughout our study in Galatians that there is indeed good news. Yes, our world is, is corrupted by maniacs and authoritarian figures like Putin that we're seeing right now wreaking havoc on our world. Yes, our souls, every one of us are born into original sin like my son was born into original sin and therefore has this corrupt nature by sin. But yet in the middle of all that, God has forged a way to deal with it once and for all. Because he loves us and he's for us he likes us. He wants us to flourish. He intends for us to thrive. He so loves the world that he's even right at this very moment engaged actively in reversing the curse of sin, reversing the curse of death, reversing the effects of the fall of creation once and for all. And one day all things will be made new again. How? Through the life the death, the resurrection, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and through his Holy Spirit in his people. God has done for us what we never could have done for ourselves. You may be tired of me saying that, because I've said it so much throughout this series, but it's true. He's made a way where there appeared to be no way. We call this news the gospel, and we have found it to be right and to be good, and to be true. We found it to be life-giving. We found that the gospel can actually free us from sin, and from death, and from fear, forever and right now. We know that people turn to all kinds of other things besides the gospel to give them freedom. We call those things idols. We know that people have different ideas about what freedom truly is. There's a great song by Andy Gullihorn about a teenage girl who just miserable on vacation, sitting in the back of the family car thinking, when is this family vacation gonna be over? When can I be free and really live? And then of course she becomes an adult and finds that life is not that easy, that freedom isn't quite what she had really wanted. And then she has a family of her own one day and she's finding out this is what the Lord has called me to and I'm actually living this free life now in the grace of Jesus Christ. What we're gonna see in our text for today is what true freedom is. That true freedom can only come by living in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that's our outline for today. True freedom only comes by living in grace. We're going to cover two sections of Galatians, kind of like we did last week. It may not all get on the air. I'm sorry. If you're watching this on television, I want you to come and be with us in person. If you can't do that, go online, woodmopbaptist.com, and you can stream the whole thing there. I'm glad y'all are here. It is good to have those conversations in the hallway and to, you know, huddle with the Bennets under the heater out there and to talk about Chernobyl with Calvin in the lobby today and to, to hear more about what Andrew Davis does with the Metro PD. I miss those conversations when you're not here. So I'm glad to, to meet Caleb's mom or to see her again and uh, all the different people who are here with us today. It matters. All right, so first at the end of chapter four, 
We're going to see this insightful analogy that Paul uses from the Old Testament. That's point number one on your outline. Paul's going to set up this analogy first. The first point under uh, this analogy is the historical background. He's going to give us the historical background of the analogy straight from the Old Testament. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Paul's like a great attorney, right? He's, he keeps catching these Galatians in this uh, false dichotomy that they've created in their own minds. He says, look, you who love the Torah, the law, you love the Torah so much. Go back to verse 21 there, Miles. You who love the law, you want to be under the law so much, you don't even listen to the law. And he's doing a play on words here because the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, we, we know those are the law, the Torah, right? The Pentateuch. He's saying that you want to follow these rules so much, but you don't even listen to the whole context of the entire Torah. And he's going to quote from Genesis, which we know is part of the Torah, is part of the law. Look at the very next verse, verse 22. For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Remember, Abraham was promised by God that he would be uh, this great father of a great nation, a special people that were called to be God's own family through which he would bless all of the earth. But remember Abraham's uh, impatience and Sarah, his wife's impatience, led them to come up with their own plan. They said, maybe we can help God out. Maybe we could do uh, kind of our own thing. And because Sarah was unable to have a baby. And they said, why don't Abraham just take your servant, your slave lady, Hagar, and have a baby with her? Boom, problem solved. And then through your child, the, this great nation would come. And of course, God was like, what are you doing? No, that wasn't the plan ever. I told you, Sarah is going to have a baby. And of course, God is faithful. All of his promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And a few years later, Sarah, in her old age, barren as she was, gave birth to Isaac. So the illustration here is between Isaac and Hagar's son, Ishmael. Both Abraham's sons, but very different circumstances. Born to different mothers and in different ways. Verse 23 says that Ishmael was born according to the flesh. That means by human means, that by human planning, by human will and human desire. Isaac, though, however, was born through promise, through the divine promise of God himself. This means that Isaac was conceived supernaturally, but Ishmael was conceived naturally. Isaac was the fulfillment of God's good plan, of God's miraculous intervention, of God's perfect timing in his perfect way. But Ishmael was born of human ideas. In this story, Paul sees an allegory. John Stott has a great commentary. Evan, I want to tell you, you need to get John Stott's commentary on Galatians. It's, it's so good. In his commentary uh, on this passage, he points out that uh, everyone is either an Ishmael or an Isaac. Every one of us is an Ishmael or an Isaac. Everyone is either what they are by nature, in fallen sin, in natural state, or they've been born again supernaturally. They've been raised to new life in Jesus, and they've been set free. And that leads us to the next point, which Paul gives us the figurative meaning the figurative meaning of this allegory. He says in verse 24, now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where Moses received the law, right? When he led the people out of Egypt, God showed up at Mount Sinai and delivered to Moses the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law. Bearing children for slavery, she is Hagar. 
Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Remember, the law doesn't enslave us, but it shows us that we are enslaved. The law reveals the state of our slavery to us because we just keep falling short of being right, of, of achieving God's standard of holiness in our lives. It shows us that left to our own ability, we're hopeless. So Paul says that Jerusalem, the center of these cultic, ritualistic practices that the Old Covenant prescribes, that that is represented by Hagar. And God's people all these years at the altar in Jerusalem have been offering these sacrifices. And no matter how many lambs, no matter how many bulls, no matter how many doves that they offered on the altar, and no matter how many Yom Kippur's, the Day of, of Atonement, they had one every year. It was never enough. It was never enough. That's why the writer of Hebrews talks about the priest standing at the altar day by day, making atonement, being like, will you guys quit it? Will you help just stop sinning? It's never enough. We can never atone for the sin of the people. The rituals just show us how enslaved we are by the law. But Sarah is different. Look at verse 26. But the Jerusalem above, that means the heavenly Jerusalem, a spiritual and superior Jerusalem, is free. And she is our mother. We've already established, Paul's been using this metaphor throughout these last two chapters, that we who are in Christ are now Abraham's offspring. We are the new covenant family of God. We are the special possession, the special people set aside to be the conduit of God's blessing throughout the whole world. Did you read the articles about pastors in Ukraine who are choosing to stay? They're training their people on how to tie tourniquets. Tourniquets. We're, we're talking about Ash Wednesday and trying to plan Holy Week stuff. They're teaching their people how to tie tourniquets. They're teaching their people first aid skills because they believe, rightfully, that they are the chosen people of God to be a blessing to the rest of the world, no matter who it may be that they help. That is who we are now. We've already established that, that we are the new covenant people. We who are born supernaturally. We who have been through the waters of baptism as a symbol of our death to ourselves and our resurrection into a whole new kind of life. We are born of the promise of redemption. We are those of whom are born according to God's good plan. And therefore, we are the citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are now God's people. This is good news. Then in verse 27, Paul goes a step further and quotes from Isaiah chapter 54. You may have heard this before. He says, for it is written in Isaiah, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Paul is, is quoting this beautiful promise from Isaiah 54, and it shows us, and I, I know many of you have walked through this journey of infertility or maybe miscarriage or maybe both, and I just want to point out that God obviously cares for you in a very special way. Barrenness is something that breaks God's heart, and one day he promises to fully heal those wounds. Isaiah 54 was written to exiles, reminding them, even the ones who would die in exile, that his good plan would not be thwarted, that love will get the last word. God addresses his people here as a woman who's been rejected by her husband because she could bear him no children. And he comforts her gently by promising future fruitfulness and glory, maybe not even in this life, but eventually love will get the last word. God is faithful to restore completely one way or another. And that promise was partially fulfilled in Israel's life when the exiles returned back to the promised land. But Paul's saying here that this promise is being further fulfilled in the new covenant 
people of God who are now Abraham's offspring, which we call the Christian church. That leads us to the third part of this section, the personal application. Every good preacher's got to have some personal application. So Paul does that in verses 28 to 31. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. Good news, we belong to a better Jerusalem. But there's some implications for what that means, okay? It's not always easy to be the people of God. Look at verse 29. Just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also is it now. What's he talking about here? We know there's one text in Genesis 29 where Isaac is having his weaning ceremony. He's about three years old. He's, he's fully weaned. And, and Ishmael's probably a teenager at this point. Most scholars think he's about 16 or 17 at this point. And the text says that during this ceremony, Ishmael laughs. He's mocking. He's scorning his little brother. Any of you have a big brother? Any of you born with a big brother? I'm sure that your big brother never picked on you, Sally. I'm sure that Dottie saw to it that your big brother never, ever picked on you, right? Is that right? <laughs> None of you with big brothers, I'm sure, ever were laughed at, were ever mocked by your older brother. Apparently, Isaac was, unlike your situation, I'm sure. We don't have an explicit account, but we know in that, that one passage that this is a pattern that a teenage brother is picking on his toddler brother. And Paul's point is that we need to expect to be mistreated by those who are not born from above. We know, Jesus tells us, in this world you will have tribulation. We're told over and over again, that whole high priestly prayer in John chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, he clearly is, is showing us you're going to face tough circumstances. You're going to face persecution by the world. We know that. But those of you who have half-brothers know that sometimes our half-brothers can be the cruelest. Our half-brothers can be the most hurtful, the most spiteful in our lives. Jesus was rejected by his own people, his own nation, his own ethnic tribe. In the Reformation, we know that many Christians died at the hands of other people who professed to be Christians. And if you go on Twitter these days, Lord help you, if you read the paper, what do you read about Southern Baptists these days? Just a lot of bitterness and infighting that can absolutely turn your stomach. And Paul says that we who are born from above should expect this kind of treatment. But good news, we can also expect a glorious inheritance. Look at verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. We have a glorious inheritance as the people of God. And, and that very next verse, after uh, Ishmael laughs at Isaac, uh, Sarah says, send the slave woman out. And for generations, the, the Jewish elite used that verse as an excuse to kick the Gentiles out, to separate the Gentiles. And Paul's saying, no, 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 you got it all wrong. You guys who are under the law, you guys are Ishmael. That's what God is saying here, is that you are going to be kicked out if you maintain this attitude of salvation by works. Many rabbis taught that that was the grounds for dismissing Gentiles again. But Paul sums up the whole argument that he's been making by saying, no, it's you who are under the law who are cast out. He wants people to come in. Look at verse 31, this, this beautiful statement. So brothers and sisters, we're not children of the slave, but of the free woman. This is good news for us again. That's all of chapters three and four, this new covenant family of God. And the Galatians had become confused about who they were spiritually. Now that they had been born again, they've already had the Holy Spirit poured out on them when they received the grace of God through Jesus Christ. But instead of embracing that new birth, embracing that new identity, they reverted back into the bondage of slavery. But the inheritance of the promise of God for those who are truly born into his family 
that inheritance is to reign with Christ in glory as fellow heirs. And if we're going to live into that reality, it means practicing a whole new kind of religion, one that's not based on our performance like every other religion is. And that leads us to a short section about true and false religion in chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. That's point number two on your outline, true and false religion. True religion is one that actually frees, that lives in freedom. False religion is the kind that just crushes you with more guilt and more rules and more feelings of unworthiness. It, it binds our souls, it enslaves our consciences. So hear this good news in, in verse one, gospel news. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Now we have a commandment. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The image here is like an ox that has a heavy wooden yoke that's so heavy and a plow to pull, and he can't get his feet through the mud. You feel like that sometimes? I do. I feel like that often. Paul says, get rid of that yoke. It's not a good way to live. You're just trying to spin your wheels in the mud and it's not working. If we're not careful, we can slip back into those old patterns of legalism, of performance-based religion. So we have to plant our feet firm in the gospel of Jesus that tells us, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we don't, our enemy would love to put that heavy yoke of false religion right back on us. And once that yoke is off, we can stand freely and live in grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then Paul moves into some specifics, verses 2 and 3. He's going to mention here how many fall from grace. That's point B on your outline, that people fall from grace. He says here, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. He's saying here that if you accept one part of the law, you have to accept all of it. You cannot pick and choose. And you may say again, why is Paul so caught up with this idea of circumcision? It's just a, a minor surgical procedure. Well, to the people in Galatia, it had become a theological procedure. It had been, become an identifier of who's in the family of God. And it's just a legalistic mindset that Paul's trying to counteract. Circumcision for these Judaizers, these false teachers who were in Galatia, had become a litmus test for salvation. Remember back in Acts chapter 15, uh, verse 1, it says, Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers and sisters, unless you're circumcised, I guess not the sisters, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. There is no salvation for the uncircumcised. That's what they were teaching. And these are these Judaizers. The gospel is that God saves us through grace alone, by faith alone, in Jesus alone. Jesus plus anything else. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus church attendance. Jesus plus going to the right Bible study. Jesus plus being in the right life group. Jesus plus good works. Jesus plus voting a certain way. None of that makes the gospel stand. Jesus plus anything is a perversion of the gospel. If you add one part of the law, you add the whole law. Either you have a religion of law or a religion of grace. Either none of it makes you right or all of it makes you right. Either you have outward signs or you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Paul makes it clear in verse 4 that for everyone who chooses outward signs, they've given up on Jesus. You're severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You've fallen away from grace. He's saying here that if you choose works, you're cut off from Jesus himself and from the grace that comes through him. And again, fall from grace is one of those terms that we hear sometimes referring to like a, a judge or a politician or too often a pastor who does something dumb and then they have a 
fall from grace. The dictionary defines that term, fall from grace, as a loss of respect or a loss of status or a loss of power. But that's not what Paul's referring to. What Paul's talking about in verse four is far greater and has far more significant consequences than a politician or a pastor falling from grace. Paul's talking about falling away from the grace of Jesus that we rely on solely for our salvation. Again, he's not saying here that you can lose your salvation. He's saying that if you depend on anything else besides God's amazing grace, you have moved away from what actually can save us and free us. And that leads us to what true religion looks like, what it means to stand in faith, to stand firm in faith as he commanded us in verse one. Look at verses five and six. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. That's what the Christian life is. I heard a very wise person say last week that Christian, the entire Christian life is basically waiting. The Christian life is, is really ultimately waiting for Jesus to come back and break into our world and say, enough, no more injustice, no more poverty, no more death, no more COVID, no more masks, no more vaccines. I'm done with all of it. No more war, no more power hungry maniacs, none of that. And he's gonna make all things new. That ultimately is where our hope is. But as we wait, we have work to do. It's not a passive waiting. We wait with eager expectation, the Bible says. While we wait, we have faith working through love. Ultimately, our hope is not in this life, and one day this, this age will end. And now we wait while working our works through love. Our faith manifests itself in the way that we work. Philippians 3.20 reminds us to keep an eternal perspective as we wait. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. Our citizenship is there. That's where all this is heading. And until then, we're waiting for Jesus Christ to break into our world and close the curtain on act four and, and draw up the curtain on the final act. Until then, we live by faith, not by sight, trusting that all of God's promises are yes and amen in Jesus. And that just the right time, God's gonna break back into our world and fix it all. Until then, true religion means to live with the life-giving faith, the life-giving hope, and the life-giving love that comes through knowing Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of people are saying that these are unprecedented times, and maybe they're right. You know, there's a lingering pandemic. We have Russia invading sovereign European nation, political, social unrest in our country, in our city, maybe in our church, having this polarization that we see so much of that is wearing all of us out. And I was thinking as I, I watched rockets hitting in Ukraine and planes taking off. It reminded me of World War II. And I was thinking about Corey Ten Boom. You know the story of Corey Ten Boom? Pretty amazing. Corey, along with her father, was a Dutch watchmaker. She was the first female watchmaker in all of Holland. And she, along with her family, are credited with saving over about 800 Jewish people from the, the Nazi Holocaust. And Corey and her family not only hid many Jews in their home, but they were also leaders in the Dutch resistance movement. What compelled them to do that? They were strong believers in Jesus Christ. An informer eventually told the Nazis what was going on in the Tin Boom household, and they swiftly arrested the family. Corey was held in solitary confinement for three months. Her father died in prison. She and her sister were moved to a, a concentration camp where her sister eventually died. And Corey was eventually let go, probably on a clerical mistake, 
while most of the other people in the group that she came in with were put to death and executed in the concentration camp. But as Christians, their faith was the basis for all of their actions. It was faith working itself out through love. Their faith was the reason for opposing the Nazis. Their faith was the reason for preserving the lives, not only of many Jewish people, but of mentally handicapped people who had been targeted as part of the Nazi eugenics program. Their faith enabled the Tin Booms to face the evil, to face the violence of the Nazi agenda with courage. We're just saying, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of each day. We don't know what each day is going to bring. For the Christians in Ukraine right now, they are living with courage and wisdom that comes from above. Corey and her family had learned that no matter what happened to them, no one could take away their freedom in Christ. No one could take away what the gospel had done for them. One of her famous quotes was, you can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. I pray that it doesn't take an invasion for you and me to know that and to believe that, for us to have the right perspective of our freedom in the gospel. I pray that we can learn to live in the freedom now, not by returning to false gods, but by looking more and more to Jesus and living by faith and working out our love. Corey Ten Boom is also credited as saying, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at rest. Let's look to God today and renew our faith in him and in his ability to do for us what we couldn't do, to make us right, to make our world right with him both now and forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gospel, for the good news that you have made this way where there was no way. God, that you so loved us, that you wanted to enact a plan to enable us to be free. God, as we talked about in our life group this morning, it's so hard for us to receive grace. And really it's our pride, oh God. We know our pride prevents us from receiving the free grace that is ours in Jesus Christ that you freely give to us. May we humble ourselves today and admit that we cannot do it on our own. We also claim, God, that your grace is so amazing that no matter where we've been, no matter how far we've fallen, your grace is strong enough to reach us there. That you call us back home as a loving father with unconditional love and unmerited favor through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have adopted us, that you have brought us into your family, not because of what we've done, but because of who you are and because of your great love for us. Help us to live more and more by faith and not by sight and what we see. Help us to live as citizens of a spiritual Jerusalem, a higher and better Jerusalem, knowing that our citizenship is in heaven and until the day when you come again, we wait for your perfect plan to be fulfilled completely. Lord, give us faith. I'm reminded of what Mother Teresa said, God, when the Cardinal asked for clarity and for discernment and wisdom. She said, I've never had any of those things. She said, I'll pray that you have more faith. God, grant us more faith so that we may have the courage to live each day for you and more and more fulfill your plan and your good purposes for our city, for our families, for our neighborhoods, for our schools, for our churches, and ultimately for the world. God, we lift up right now my brothers in Belarus, for Dima, for Misha, for Sergey, for uh, Igor, for all their churches, that you would encourage them, that you would fill them with what they need to be your hands and feet during this time. Lord, we pray for the whole church planning movement for Philip, the company man. God, we pray for all of the people that are right now actively seeking to bring your kingdom to earth as it looks so hellish right now in Ukraine. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in the high and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.
Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you've never accepted the free grace of God that's offered to you in Jesus Christ, if you've never believed that God is really good and that he actually loves you and welcomes you, there's no better time to come into his family than right now. Maybe you've been spinning your wheels, you feel like that ox in the mud and you're just tired and you're exhausted with that yoke of performance on you. And you're ready to live freely in the grace of Jesus Christ. I encourage you to throw that yoke off and to live in grace and in faith. Your actual good works will come. Don't worry about those for now. They will come as you are sanctified, as you are made more like Jesus, all through his grace and the Holy Spirit who fills you more and more each day. Outwardly, you may be wasting away. Someone was telling me about their phone falling apart and they said, the phone's kind of like me. It's a little old and it's a little dated and falling apart. And I was reminded that again in Corinthians, we're told that outwardly we may be wasting away, but inwardly we're being renewed day by day. And that's my prayer for all of us. Maybe you wanna join Woodmont and you say, I'm in. I wanna be a part of what God's doing here. We believe in church membership and being part of a family of faith that you're accountable to and that we're accountable to you, that you lift one another up. If today's the day you wanna do that, maybe you've never been baptized and you say, I feel called to follow Christ's example of believers' baptism is a powerful outward symbol of an inward reality that's happened to me. If that's you today, whatever it is, maybe you just are so broken for the people in Ukraine, you just wanna to come to the altar and kneel and pray before the Lord. Whatever it is you need to do during this time, let's stand and sing about our Jesus and how much we love them, how much we love him. My Jesus, I love thee. Let's stand and sing. Amen. May we love Jesus more and more. All of this, you know, right doctrine around the gospel, none of that matters. None of it matters if we don't have a love relationship with Jesus Christ. May he be more and more exalted, just like this cross behind us in our lives as we learn to love him more and more. And guess what? He is worthy. He is lovable. He is good. He is more beautiful 
and more uh, glorious than anything else we could possibly imagine or anything that this world can provide. May we learn to believe that more and more as we love him more than anything else. Uh, I got asked a question about what organizations can we support right now that are uh, ministering in Ukraine and that are working in Ukraine. Uh, I have a couple of uh, options. One is Bob Hartman International Ministries. They're in, in uh, Belarus. Obviously, the IMB. IMB pulled out their people from Ukraine uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, my friends in Belarus are actually helping those Ukrainians. A lot of them uh, went to Belarus. Uh, there, uh, Bob Hartman does most of his work in Belarus, but there's two other organizations. If you want to write this down, and we'll probably send out an email soon, and I'll be talking with the missions committee. But my divinity school, Beeson, Anton, who's from Russia, recommends these two organizations. One is Pathway Ministries. Pathwayministriesinc.com is the website. That's one of the organizations that Anton knows personally and trusts. The other one is Ismail Life Care Center. I-Z-M-A-I-L, I -L. the website is lcc-ismail.org. If you want to read it in English, put slash E-N, uh, lcc-ismail.org slash E-N. Otherwise, it'll be in Cyrillic, and that might be difficult to read. Wonderful day of worship today. I'm just excited about Karen Jim, your new house, and your sister and mom with us all the way from Dallas today. I hadn't seen y'all since the wedding, so good to see y'all. Welcome back to Nashville. Uh, closed on a house in Goodlettsville area, is that right? Yeah, not really Goodlettsville, but the rural, most rural part of Davidson County that you could possibly find, they found it. So congratulations to them. Uh, a lot of things going on in our church right now. Don't miss Wednesday's Ash Wednesday. It's the first day of Lent. We will observe an Ash Wednesday service here that might be outside of your wheelhouse, or you may have grown up in a liturgical tradition that celebrates uh, Ash Wednesday. It's a powerful time of repentance, of confession, that we have found to be life-giving and good as we head into this season of preparing our hearts and our souls for the blessed Easter season. Until that time, let's uh, receive a word of benediction. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Go in peace. This has been the live broadcast of Woodmont Baptist Church. If you would like to know more about the people and programs at Woodmont, or if you would like to stream both live and pre-recorded services, go to woodmontbaptist.com or call us at 615-297-5303. This program is funded by the members and supporters of Woodmont Baptist Church and is produced by Woodmont Baptist Television. Thanks for watching.